Yeah, yeah. I mean, in a sense, the, the Boogie's book is, is the core and you have done a lot of uh, projects as well, you know, on yourself and with others as well as part of their books uh, on uh, Malay history and memory. Uh, tell us about your interest in, you know, uh, in graves and cemeteries. Oh, yeah. yeah that's something I forgot to tell you. Now, apart from pictures of the Masjid Tumangong Tang Ibrahim, I also take pictures of tombstones, tombstones photographs. So at the first time when I put it in social media, my mom and my mother-in-law and my cousins said, mm. oh, so what are you into now? Man? Are you into something spiritual or bunyan or haunted? I said, no, no, I'm not. I just, I just want to take the picture of the grave because it tells a story. You know, like, like, you know, like historians, you, as historians, you can go and get all the primary records and whatever. Uh, then if you're an archaeologist, you can dig the ground, like John would say. But for me, I mean, I'm not any of those, so I couldn't dig the ground or go into any primary sources. So the only way for me to appreciate uh, history is through cemeteries, the gravestones, the pathology, location, the type of people who are buried here, and, and so on. So uh, when I went to Tumagong, I also photographed the cemeteries. So the, some, 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 of the, some of the tombstones, they look very, very unique. They have octagonal structure. Some of them are made of wood. So they have wood and metal. Uh, some of them are, are just ball, uh, one, one, one ball, like that, and so on. But then they definitely look a lot different than what we find in Lim Chukang Cemetery. So the ones in Jalan Kubo and the one in Tamang Masjid Tamang Gong, they, they look very unique and very grand. But that also, that also made me want to know who they who they are. And they said this belongs to the Sultan, Sultan of the relatives of relatives from the Sultan of Johor, the Ottoman Empire and, and so on. Now this also became uh, a topic that I shared in my social media. And I've got lots of people from across the Causeway and Malaysians say, hey sorry friend, you managed to go into the Kamangong cemetery. Yeah, I'm a Singaporean. I can go in there. So they share with me their stories. So my stories got my stories build up from all this information, the inputs so they build build up over the years. So sometimes like one time one gravestone, I will attract like almost a hundred comments. Say, oh this thing, this thing. This. So I I I, I never turn I never turn down anyone. Okay, the best thing about uh, social media is that no, you get lots of information first. Second thing is that whenever people comment on my post, I'll reply. You know? I'll reply every mm, comment. Mm. Until my wife and my mother say, "Hey, you're free. You, I see your Facebook. You reply everyone, even hello." So you say, "Yo, I'm." Uh, say, but that's important to me because you know, uh, it creates a bond. I believe in creating a bond. So when you create a bond, uh, when you want something, you you ask them, they'll answer, they'll help you. So all these friends I have, the five thousand contacts I have for my Facebook, I I I've met or I've spoken to almost like eighty five percent of them. Wow. Or to ninety percent. Yeah, I mean. I, I you know, uh, uh, was quite, quite surprising. I, I tried to meet all of them, you know, during my free time. Okay, he said, meet me at National Library, Hanis. Hey, look, Hanis tomorrow, really. Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, Hanis, uh, I'll be there at uh, 3 p.m. Okay, then they'll come and share with me. So, uh, I tried to connect to almost every, everyone who, who contributes to my story. So, these are, these are the all records. I mean, I tell you 70 all records in my book. I think there are more. Yeah. There are more. Yeah. Yeah. I can't mention it. I can't mention all of them. No, uh, when, when, I, when I launched my book, when I launched my book uh, last year, August, uh, I expect maybe 100 people come. Uh, at, the, at the end of the day, there were 320 people came. So it took turns to just uh, meet up, take photographs, but I feel very, very honored. And these are the guys who tell me, so I remember you replied my comment about uh, Majid uh, Kampung Kalang. So, yeah, yeah, I, I remember. I, I didn't remember, but I said, okay, I remember. <laughs> Just to make sure that everything is everyone's happy, but yeah. So, uh, Grace, so back to back to your question about Grace. Yeah, I, I use Grace as another focal point for people. You know, like so people, so so they so they will contribute. The problem with Malay Grace, the problem with Malay Grace mm. or Muslim Grace and Bukit Brown, is Bukit Brown. You have all the names written, all right? You can uh, you have all the pictures of the ancestors. You have the genealogy on the 
on the some of the graves. Whereas for Muslim graves, the old graves they don't have any names. There are no names. Huh? Then there's no genealogy or nothing. Mm-hmm. So it's very, very hard for me to 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 locate who was buried here. So when I did a project together with Professor Kevin also, for was Sigla that the Cemetery, book? Yeah. Oh, Sigla. Okay, okay. Oh, so sorry. Yeah, uh, the book came, came earlier. But after that, Professor Kevin had a project to do about the history of Siglap. So Professor Kevin called me to say, hey, can you do the Siglap Cemetery, the Kubuka Sim? Uh, so that was, that was the first time I worked with him. That was in 2014, almost 2015. Hmm. So I worked with him. You know? That was where I learned how to write in a scholarly manner <laughs> for tough. Because it's a report for NHB, so they saw a book and started to write really right, properly. Right. Yeah. Uh, so that's the first time I learned to write. Like how you guys write, like, you know, but I'm still far away. Like. <laughs> uh, that, uh, that, that was the time, the time when I started to uh, document cemeteries. So I, I was there for almost two months. Mm. You know, I, I, I did my, I, I, I worked in the, in the morning, but in the afternoon I go to the cemetery to see who are the people who's coming to the cemetery and I start to get their stories. Uh, so this, uh, this, this got me acquainted to cemeteries a lot. Mm. A lot. Uh, so, yeah, I forget to tell you, uh, before how Kevin got to, got me to this project, because uh, when they were looking for people, when he was looking for people who can do cemetery studies, uh, it was this lady called Teng Teng, Tan Teng Teng. Yeah, I know Teng Teng. Teng Teng, Teng Teng says, Kevin, there's, there's this guy called Sarah Fion, uh, if you look at his Facebook, uh, there are lots of cemeteries, uh, I think he likes cemeteries. <laughs> So that was when they, they got me on board uh, to do the history project. Uh, Hidayah also told Kevin, said, Sarafan can, can do the cemetery uh, because he likes cemeteries. Uh. So when I met them, I told them, uh, it's not liking cemetery, but it's just to know the history of Singapore through cemeteries. It was so my student who, who told uh, told me about you, you know, uh, you know oh. because of, of that cemetery we were looking at previously. So I asked him okay. if he knew anything about that cemetery. He said no, uh, but he went on to, you know, do some search and he showed me one of your videos. I see. What's that? Huh? Who's that? What, your student? Huh? Uh, yeah, yeah, my, my student, Abbas. Yeah. Abbas, oh, okay. Abbas. Mm-hmm. He, he did his yeah, so, masters in uh, NUS. Anyway, uh, mm. I th- so I think it was really fascinating, right? You mentioned, you know, the people who came to your book launch, the people who are on Facebook. So there's a very healthy memory, right? Uh, a social memory among the Bugis or maybe the Malay community. Although they mm. might not want to be cited uh, specifically, you know, they are worried about certain things. They are being recorded. But uh, the memory is very much alive, in the community, isn't it? Yes, it's, 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 it's life. You know, um, uh, when when I when I publish this book to our boogies, you know, this part of the core being uh, the history of boogies, and you know, I also share some documentation about boogies and the lifestyle, the food, the fabrics, and so on. I I believe this book is more about Singapore, mm. you know, about, about about Singapore, about Singapore. You know, it can be anyone. It can be a Chinese, it can be Indian, so it can be anyone. You know, until I tell everyone that, you know, this book is just, you can just remove my name, Sarif and Saleh, put your name there, put your parents' name, everything. It becomes, they just tell a story according to this concept. It's, it'll be your book. So uh, I'm trying to touch on to everyone. You know, of course, I, I use the, the, the word, the word, the word, Bugis as, as a cause of my, of my project, but mm. it can be applied to almost anyone. And, and everyone who wishes to run. Yeah. I just want to go back to your camera again, you know. Um, oh. Since the 80s, you were shooting um, from then till now, which is almost 30 years, right? What yeah. have been the changes that your camera and your eye has documented? <laughs> you know, uh, uh, my, my, I got this, I, I, photography, yeah, photography actually, I got, photography for my dad. So my dad was from Mediacorp. He, he was in Mediacorp, he was the cameraman. Then he went to news, he went to, he went to news and journalism, called ENG, Electronic mm-hmm. News Gathering. That was in Mediacorp. Uh, so he was, he was also a supervisor and the head of, of the department as, as he went along. 
So I probably I, prob- I probably got hooked onto him. You know, when I see him doing photography, uh, photojournalism, I asked him why must the picture be like that. Say, oh yes, yes, we compose in such a manner because it tells a story. So he was the main person who guided me in photography. Uh, the first camera that I took, the first camera that I borrowed from him, take a picture like the one you said, Tomango, the, the book, in, in, which is the book, it was a Roli. Okay. Roli, Roli yeah. Flex. Huh? So, so when he bought his first Roli Flex or Roli 35mm, uh, it was in Chai Chi. After that, I, think, I think it was Chai Chi. Uh, that's, there a was a that's where the factory is. Fact, yeah, that's right. A factory is a factory, yeah. So you know, him being part of the part of the journalist journalism group like, you know, like Jerry Say from Straits Times, so like, I I met all of them before. So they I think they went to Chai Chi or somewhere else. They bought the Rolly Flex. So I I, I followed my dad. My dad is a my dad is a fan of Rolly Flex <laughs> and Leica <laughs> like, in those days. He likes cameras. So I remember when he bought camera. My mother my mother asked how much is that. <laughs> I remember. I think my dad told her a different price. So. <laughs> but that was those days. That was in the seventies. But I remember, I remember things vividly. When I was four years old, I could remember things already. Also, when uh during uh, when I was in sec three, I borrowed his Rolex, Ro- Rolex camera, and I started photographing until I until I started doing wedding photography mm. in sec four. You know, I was a young, I was young, but I like to sec four. Money. You were doing wedding photography. Yes, yes, <laughs> I mean, yes. I was doing wedding photography. You know. No, I just imagine those people. Sec four today it looks so small, but I was when I was in secondary four. I was already quite enterprising. I did only photography until I got married. So during those times in the army, and I'm in the weekends I take photography also. Uh, so, uh, when I was in sec four, uh, I started doing wedding photography, and I borrowed some money from my dad. I bought a Nikon FE two, world's fastest camera at the time, to go up to four thousand percent of second, right? So I bought a camera at at Safe Superstore. At Beach Road. Uh, so, uh, I used the camera to do photography, serious photography. Uh, so, over the years, I started to do photography and I make sure that when I take photograph, I must it must be well composed such that it tells a story. And my dad told me, my dad told me whatever pictures you take now, you may, it may look very, may look, uh, there's no value, zero value, but you will need this, you will probably see this picture valuable in years to come. And that's true enough. The um, Mr. Tamangong, which I photographed at the time, you know, is in my book now. That was almost 30 years ago, 30, 40 years ago. So it's in my book now. So that was something that he, he always tell me. So when you take a photograph, it must be well composed. So uh, then again, as we, I went along, you know, until, until when I was in the army, when I was in the army, I was in Taiwan, Brunei, I brought my, my camera. You know, my, my sergeant, Sergeant Wei, he's an airborne ranger. I was in OCS at the time, officer for that. So, you know, I brought my camera. Then uh, you see my back, and uh, when we were training, uh, punish us. Oh, we cannot take We cannot take in this Brunei. Then he said, "Okay, stop, stop, stop. Everyone stop. Okay, Sarafia, where's your camera? You know, in, in my public position, he asked my camera. Oh, you see my back, Sergeant. Take your camera. So I take out the camera. Pass to you. Okay, carry on. Oh, okay, take it. He took photograph. No? So, 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 I was like, I mean. This part of all whatever training we had, hardship training we had, I was allowed to bring camera for our for our memories. Something, something very special. Uh, something very special. I was reserved since so I brought my camera. So camera the camera was with me. When I went to India mm-hmm. at the time, uh when I went to India to work, some of the engineers told me so friends, don't bring this big camera, you get robbed. In those times like in the early 90, uh, late nineties. So I, I I said I must bring something. I want to capture. So I bought a disposable camera in in the airport before before I flew off. Uh, I took photographs when I was in India. So whatever I did, I must have the camera with me. And uh, it's all about memory, you know, memory. It's, I mean, I've I've got tons of pictures in, in my store room now. I have not looked at it. All prints, mm. India, China, everywhere. I travel because I I travel a lot for my for my work. Um. Over the years, so I, I so I do my video. So I, over the years, I, I my camera improved, like, but not 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 as not as super as some of my other friends. You know, I bought a Canon and so on. And uh, when this smartphone came about, you know, this camera became useless for me. <laughs> so a smartphone is more is 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 better. Like. So I have my I have smartphone with me every time, and I, I start to photograph. So over the years, over the years, I I, I always photograph. 
and anything and everything. And it's all about heritage and history. Heritage and history. You no, know, I, I I save everything. I, I have Google Drive. I save anything mm, and everything. Mm. Even today, when I go out, I'll photograph. So, to me, camera, to, to me, uh, it's all about memory. It may not be something value, value now. It will be valuable even after I die. And, of course, when YouTube came about, I started to do video. Because videography is another interesting thing. And when I post videos on my YouTube, my father will always criticize earlier on. So ah, he, he's a, really? Because he will tell me, so <laughs> friend, yeah, yeah. Okay, so friend, you, 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 you just start the video this way. You know, that way. He, he'll tell me what to do with the composition, storyline. That was the early part. So until now, so I see Sven Bai, no? So now when he see my YouTube, he says, well, this is good, that's good, that's good. I get all the compliments from him. That's actually very good so, advice, yeah. Yeah, good advice. But still, he, I, when I take video, I just want to please my father. I know it's not not a media standard or not a broadcasting standard, but at mm. least I, I'm there. But then again, he's still, he's still, he'll still give me tips, he'll nurture me. Even until mm. now, he's still alive. My parents still alive, so they, they will look at my YouTube. Right, no right. Problem. Do you think of those photos that you've taken, all those thousands and tens of thousands, there have yeah. been places that have changed dramatically or, you know, even uh, disappeared already? Yes, a lot. I've got, I've got a lot. I've, I, I know a lot of uh, places that have disappeared. In my YouTube, in my YouTube, uh, entitled then and now, mm. then and now. Yeah, I, I, some of the photographs are taken by my dad, taken by me, where some of the places actually vaporized already. Like Rocho, uh, uh, Cortina, you know, Cortina, no, there's this place called Cortina. Uh, which is today the Parliament House. I can't remember. Yeah. So, all right. Wow. So, so this place, so this place, all gone. I remember. I mean, I remember where I walk. I remember the yeah. smell. I remember the people, the atmosphere. Yeah. So, yeah, it's very sad. So, I can't find some pictures. You know, like Empress Place, Empress Place, Prince Edward Food Centre. I couldn't find all these pictures really. So, uh, I regret I didn't take those photographs. Mm. So, but it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. I'm, I'm sure somebody has it. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. So talking about places, um, you know the the boogies that most people know today, right? Yeah. Boogies Village. Okay. What 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 does that mean to you, and to boogies history? Okay. Um. I think the boogies the the. the you see, if you look at if you look at history, if you look at the history of Malaya uh, of 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 the Malay Archipelago, mm. the boogies. History is very, very short and intense. Very short and intense. It's all, when it came to Malaya, it was only starting from the year 1700. And by 1900, they, their names also vaporized. Because they couldn't really overcome. I mean, they, they overcome the, a bit, uh, they overcome part of the Dutch power, but they didn't, they cannot overcome the British power. So they have, they just have to work along with the British lines and, and the names just, I mean the places the places just spill. But okay, the names exist because of, of the street. Uh, but uh Yeah, what's the question? What's the question again? I drifted a bit. <laughs> uh sorry, sorry. People in Singapore would have no idea yeah. or very little idea about Boogie's history, Boogie's heritage. Uh the Boogies that they know would be Boogie's uh, MRT, you know, Boogie's yeah, village. Yes. So that is, in a sense, just a name, you know. Uh, but is there a history behind these places? Yes. Yeah. That, that's that's where the that's where you can find the story from the book. Mm. You know, uh, it's a blessing that the name Bugis Street Bugis Junction still exists. Uh, mm. Something that I can click onto and, and start telling a story about it. So yes, there there were there, there were there were settlements there were Bugis settlements. At Boogie Street, Boogie Junction. In fact, uh, when I gave a talk to URA last mm. week mm. on Boogies in Chinatown. Boogies in Chinatown? Boogies. Where? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, okay, uh, I, I gave a talk to URA there, the yeah. Friends of Museum last week. Okay, but it, it was in URA Center. Okay, uh, before Raffles came, before, before Raffles effect came, where they had this Jackson plan and segregation of the mm. place, right? The Bugis were having properties from Kalang from Kalang River 
all the way up to Cantonment Police Complex. Mm. So they have houses and they have houses and kampos, street houses, shop houses, everything. Uh, that stretch together with the Chinese. Until Raffles came, then they start to segregate. Raffles said that this is a city fishing village. Nobody lived here and and you know, he brought up brought Singapore. But before he came, this the Bugis and the and the Chinese and some of the Chola people, the Chulias, they were all living along the coast. So this, uh, all these are, uh, there are records on, on this. Uh, so, uh, these are the things that, 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 that I put in the book, right? I put in the book. So when I talk about, when I talk about the Bugis Chinatown, I, I, I mentioned about all this, about this, this early settlements. And, uh, and, uh, of course, when 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 Raffles came, when he was developed, everything has everything was flattened out. You know, the campos all were mm. all flattened. Uh, those wealthy ones, you know, they they could, they could buy properties at the coast, which eventually became uh, owned by the government until today. So, uh, the Bugis settlements in Kampung Java or in Kampung Glam or in Kampung Bugis also gone because of development. So what's left is just what what's left is just street names. So I'm trying to, what I'm trying to tell uh people in this book is that mm. these were once the Bugis settlements. Okay, the, the Bugis built settlement because their ships came from Sulawesi, they anchor they, they dropped the anchor in Kalam River, in Clifford Pier, in Pasir Panjang, and that's where they have all the Bugis villages. So this is just a this is just a memory. Memory. Right. Okay, yeah. there, there are evidence, there are evidence in archives saying that the Bugis Campos in Kalang. And that's 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 about it. So people don't even know that there were Bugis settlements there before, together with the Hainanese village. So what's left are just names. So this book tells okay, this is how it looked like in the house like this, you know, the people live around here, the population of Bugis before as compared to today. Yeah. So that's my objective. Yeah. Yeah, I think the book uh, does that. Uh, and also, I think maybe you have done that already, you know, through your guiding work. Um, so tell us about, you know, what you do as a tour guide and the places that you go. Okay. Um, uh, when, when I started my... When, when my did you start? Like, when, when did you start that, with that? Yeah. I, actually, I started, I started guiding during my... I started guiding a long time back, uh, in 2015. Mm. You know, I, I started to guide friends, not tourists, just friends. Because, because I know uh, to to guide to be a tour guide you need a license. So I just have license at the time. So I guide friends. I have this I have I join groups like uh three T R E Tomas Rural Explorer and Soviets. It's, it's, it's actually a social Facebook group. Right? And my of course my own group called Bugis Tomasi. Mm. So whenever I have something new like uh, Kampung Glam or Kalang or Kalang Kramat Kalang or Tolok Blanga, I say to I'll publish on my social media. I say there will be a, a tour, a trail this weekend or next weekend. So give me your names and you meet up in this place. I'll bring you around. So that was a, like a warm up, warm up to my heritage walk and tourist guiding. The best part of this is that you no, know, I get stories from the locals. Who once lived there before, like in Kalang, in Pulau Blanga, and so on, or in Chinatown. So tell me the stories about about uh, their life there. That so I record, I will record it. I mean, I, I think that's an oral record. I record it, and I get a number, and I find a different time to interview them. So even until today, when I do my heritage walks of Pulau Blanga, I I have I'll get numbers of people who live there, and get the stories. So the, the stories keep expanding and expanding. Mm. So uh, I do lots of guidings. I do lots of guidings, heritage guidings, Pulok Blanga. Uh, this month and next month, I'll be very busy uh, guiding students and public, uh, in public uh, for Bukit Chandu, Bukit Chandu Petro mm. Tour. Mm. So, so along the way, along the way, I, I'll sort in stories of Singapore. Not the boogies, no, because no, it's like, I don't to be really off <laughs> off tangent. No? So I'll, but I'll talk about the history of Singapore. Why Singapore is an island highly sought after. Why the Japanese I say it, I I'll always tell them that it's not only the Japanese who invaded us, there were other wars in Singapore that we have witnessed. So uh and that actually interests them. 
So you'll, you'll ask, you'll ask questions, and that's where I'll answer. And they'll share stories of them living in Pasir Panjang, in Kampung Cherry, uh, in in uh, in uh, the Southern Islands. Some of them are from Pulau Sakeng, they come to Singapore, the Japanese came. Mm. So these are stories I, I get a lot. Uh, I've got lots of stories which I I get to pen it down. So heritage work is a is one good way for me to get stories from people. They are really they really yes. want to share. So excited, say, oh yeah, I've got some I got someone to resonate with me. So yeah. I mean, that's so interesting, right? It's not like they are blank slate and they don't have anything. They actually have a lot of stories in their head, but they want to yeah, go so on no. these walks. They want to share. They want to find a partner who is willing to listen. Yes. So if you can resonate with them, they'll share. They'll sing to you. So I've got lots of stories you know, waiting to write down. I'm busy. What's the next book going to be? Uh, I'm giving a talk and I'm giving a talk in uh, ACM, uh, 26th February, about the Lost Palace of Singapore. So I've got lots of, I've got, I've got people who are asking me, when is this book coming out? When is it coming out? No? Lost Palaces. Wow. So that, so I hope I can, I can launch this book by end of this year. Ah, so it's but almost I'm, done. Uh, it, it should be quite almost, close. Almost, All right. Uh, quite close, quite close. So I present, I'm giving a spoiler, uh, not spoiler, but a, a, a teaser this February in, in ACM. So it's a, pub, a Monday morning lecture. We we'll talk about a bit, no? teaser. No? <laughs> nice title. I can launch it by huh? Nice title. What? Nice title. Yeah. Thank you. It's your own, right? It's not from Kevin, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. It's my own. <laughs> actually, this Lost Palaces, the first person who, the first person who actually uh, got me started was uh, you know the the, the this lady from Straits Times, Melody Zakis. Uh, Melody, Melody yes. Zekis, okay. yeah. uh, so she interviewed me she interviewed me uh, for the story Marang story the Marang Cemetery grave you know? so I was opening my scrapbook I was telling my scrapbook then she saw one pitch and said what's that Sarafian <laughs> and I said well there was a lost palace hey I want to make a story also so she published a story two months after she published the Marang story mm, mm. That's uh, so nice. she interviewed me uh, she interviewed me she, everything come everything come in uh, so she was one of those to, to write. Yeah, it's a pity she's Hopefully no longer there, right? Yeah, she's good. Eh? But she's only Very there. good, yeah. Very um, good. I want to ask you, is, is there a case, you know, for heritage conservation uh, for Bugis history? So far, no. Hmm. So far, I don't, I don't hear of any, anybody who wants to conserve hmm. the Bugis history. You know, um, it's very sad that they, they once had a replica of the Bugis ship in Malay Heritage Centre mm. and Bugis Junction and totally gone. So I I don't know what's next. Sometimes I even ask Professor Lai Chi Kian. Yeah. You know, he did a model of the he did a model of the National National Theatre, right? Mm. In in Valley. I asked him I want to ask him, I have to ask him, maybe just I hope I hope you watch his video. La. Oh I got a call. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Go, no, go, no worries. I don't know, Steve. I, I sit down. Okay. So, I want to ask him, uh, can you start, do a sculpture of the Bugis PVC and you know, put it somewhere in Lavender or somewhere in Rocho? I also ask him that. Like, maybe if he watch this video, he say, okay, Sarafian. I saw, so, yeah. Uh, there isn't any. There isn't any. Uh, mm. why, why don't you mount it? You know, uh, apply for a project grant uh, yourself. I mean, now I you have, have the credentials to do it, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, let, let, let's see how. Uh, let's see how. I don't know how to go about it. Mm. But let, let's let's see how. Because, you know, I've got lots of things. I want to leave a legacy. So, I mean, it's, Bukis is, has disappeared. I mean, yeah. it's amongst us now, amongst the Malays, or amongst Singaporeans. But then, uh, there is a legacy for us to remember that they were the early traders together with the Chinese and Indians so that has been a platform for Raffles to just sit on top and make us prosper further so that's that's something that i wish i could do but i don't know when mm. and also how you know how to do this you know what's the best way is it through mm. a book is it through talks through tours through you know like a walking trail or something what what do you think uh, uh, i think that's okay the, the book is now a, a good reference uh like a like a 
a way to start. Uh, I may have another book. Walking trails is something that I do naturally uh, over the weekend. Yeah. So, but then I would like to have something uh, like a, a small monument or a sculpture just to tell it this. This is uh, this was once where the Boogie Street. Yeah, you know, I, I felt very sad when I went to Boogie's Junction last year, and there is a plaque about the Boogie's history. It's gone. They took it off. I don't know why. Mm. If you go to Boogie Street, you go to Boogie's Junction, right? Uh, yeah. Beside McDonald, McDonald's. Yeah, yeah. McDonald's on the left. If you walk straight, uh, a few years ago, or should I say last year, early last year, there was this plaque telling about the Boogie's traders. Why, why is this place called Boogie's? Because there were Boogie's traders who lived in Victoria Street. It was there for like 10 years, since 2012. And uh, 2012, uh, last year I don't see it anymore. Yeah, okay. They took it off. So I said, why? Why is it? Why, 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 why can't they just leave it there? No? Or have some brass plug? You know? So this is something that's it's questionable. Uh. Mm. Why? Why is it, uh, so? I, I I wish I hope they can put it back there or have some other things to tell the history of Boogies. I walk everywhere and anywhere. I I couldn't find any plot that says what the Boogies. We have Kapung Glam, no, we have Kapung Java, but no Kapung Boogies. Where is yeah. it? <laughs> Strange. Strange. So the way the way the way to start is okay. I started a book about the, about the Boogies. I wish I could start. I should. I, I wish I could have time to write some more. You know, because there are lots of things that, that came in after this book was launched. Lots of stories. You know, lots of people who say that they I left them behind. They say, no, I didn't leave you behind. It's just that I don't even know you at the time, and you don't know me. <laughs> you know, so, but, but they 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 are they are very nice. Thanks, you can. Now I've got I've got no, but with this book, I I no, I've got a few Chinese people who live in Kampung Bugis. Mm, mm. I don't put I I. I didn't put this book because it's, it's going to be very thick. But I've, the, I, I've, I've interviewed a few Chinese. Some of them are Hainanese chicken rice seller. You know? Hainan, yeah, mostly Hainanese. And they say when they cook, when they cook uh, this uh, chicken rice or they exchange with the boogies and the cakes in Kapung Boogies. Mm, mm. Uh, so this will, be, this will be the next the next installment of the next book. Right. If you read my book uh, on the Bukeh Hosui Fire, Squatters into Citizens, uh, oh. I cover the Kampong Bugis fire in 1950. Oh, yes, yes. That, okay. that was a great fire in the sense that it really showed that the British didn't care, right? Uh, the, 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 they couldn't uh, respond well, stop the fire. And after the fire, they basically didn't do anything for the fire victims. It was left to the community um, to to give donations and build some temporary yeah. housing there. So, but it it was the last fire in that area, uh, where that the, the British had this laser fair attitude towards public housing. Yeah. And after that, you know, in the fires in Geylang, uh, some small steps were taken, uh, to, uh, provide re emergency housing. But uh, uh, the the Bukis Kampong Bukis fire is remarkable. Basically, the the Kampong rebuilt itself after the fire. It came back. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, 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 did yeah. that ever come out in your interviews? No, I did not. <laughs> but they told me that, they, they told me there was a, they told me there was a fire in the eighties. Eighties, uh. Was there still yeah. a kampong there? No more, right? Uh, no, no more kampong. No mm -hmm. kampong. It, was, it was just it was just fire. But this this early kampong, no, I did not. Mm -hmm. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Um, three thousand fire victims. It was a huge oh, fire. God. Yeah. It's a huge fire. Mm, huge. That was in the 50s, huh? early 50s. 1950, yeah. 1950s, yeah. I think that was where LKY started to uh, prepare for self governance, huh? take over British, decolonize the British. He, he was probably still in his law office. <laughs> a law office, yeah. So it sounds like, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, we, we can expect more from you. You have uh, really been bitten by the writing bug. <laughs> and, you know, so many things to pull together, you know, and uh, put up. Yeah, so little time. So yeah, little time. so that people don't accuse you of leaving, leaving them behind next time. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, more. I mean, I'm sure after I publish the next book, there'll be people who felt they're left behind. But, but yeah. yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll do my best on that. I'll do my best. You know, quickly, yeah, because those people who came to me, they are all elders. They're quite old. Already. And some of them didn't have a chance to see the book. 
they've passed on. So it's very sad. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm very encouraged by, you know, what I hear from you today. You know, someone, an engineer who is so passionate and, you know, is not too caught up with, uh, you know, uh, working every day. You have your own company. Uh, but it shows uh, that uh, there is someone who is willing to speak to the community and trace their histories and their family histories. Yeah. And also that, you know, lots of people are actually very keen to share, uh, you know, uh, to relate their stories. So many rich and vivid stories of the recent past. I, I always advise everyone to start writing. Mm. Start writing your family history, your, your genealogy. Like, so, this, so this is very, very shy. Eh? Some people are very shy to write. Even for me, you know, when I first want to write, I've got negative remarks from my family. They say that, hey, you're not a writer. <laughs> How can you be able to write? Yeah. So so be prepared for that. But then always look in a positive manner that you, you, you tell them you, you write the history of the family. We, we, at least some our generations to come will remember what we've done. Some families they, they this is like my family. My family I, my family I don't come from a very wealthy family or, or no, nothing spectacular. Just a normal family. Mm. Uh, but then uh uh our forefathers come to Singapore for a course come here because they know there is a, a future here in Singapore. They come here because they want to seek well. So those who survive here in Singapore are those really hardworking ones. Eh? Okay. So this is something that you can take pride of. Even no matter how little you contribute to the community, eh? just be proud of it. So I, that's what I tell, tell everyone. Just write history. Be it yourself a Boyanese or Javanese or Hakka yeah. or, mm. you know, or, or Kaka. No? Just, just write it. Because you no, know, eventually you find there is a pot of gold. And the pot of gold is not money, but it's just but it's friendship. Friendship and new rel newfound relatives. That's what I feel to be. You, know, you get lots of friends, I get lots of people who contribute stories. I realize that these people who I don't even know they are actually related to me, third cousins. Mm. You'll be very you'll be very surprised. Yes, yes, you'll be very surprised. Rahani Wahab, the one who edited my book. I, I only knew him. I only knew him uh about 15, what, 10 years ago. I, I know that he was my cousin. But 10 years ago, he, he, we look, he, we, we share the same grand, uh, grandparents. So the same great-grandfather, dying Dasin. Surprise, you know. Tears of joy. So, you know, we start to write. I just have two so, quick questions. Uh, one okay. is, uh, maybe you are the best person to advise, which is, yeah. if people are quite shy to write, you know, um, how do they write? How would you encourage them to write? You know, so that you know they can feel that they are doing a decent job. You need not put your real name. Mm. You just put a name of someone. You 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 become a narrator of your story. You see, let's say, uh, okay, I can say, okay, I live in Aukang. I was born in Aukang in 1917. Uh, uh, it's a Chinese family. I'm the only Malay, I'm the only Malay family. Felt so odd, but we we lived through. Okay, so right there, you just said, I have a friend who lives in Haugang. He's a Malay of Bugis descent. He married, uh, you know, he, he, he lived amongst the Chinese uh, and the family felt odd. Uh, you can write like that. You, you, don't, you don't have to mention a name. Because when you mention, when you mention a name, sometimes you feel very, very shy, you feel mm. very odd. Uh, so you just mention someone's name. Uh, so uh, that's how you write it indirectly. So initially I wrote like that. No? Initially I wrote like that. Yeah, really. And uh, friends will ask me, who's that guy? No? Well, sounds like uh, he knows a lot of story there. You know, we have to connect to him. And eventually, then I say, it's actually me. It's actually me. It's, it's my story. So yeah, if those who are shy to write, you write in that manner first. Second thing is that you get, you talk to a friend. Like you know, I've got some friends who who's shy to tell the story. Talk to me. Let me write for you. So I, I'll package it. I'll package it such a way that, you know, it's your story. So uh, so your story is, to me, like, I'll tell a story of Pak Dola. I'll tell a story of uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Go. Uh, I'll write. So that, that's the way. So either you tell him to write indirectly or you write for him. So eventually, when he sees articles good, you know, then let him, then he probably will take from there to write. I think those are two that's, great that's tips. Fine. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's my approach. 
Uh, and the last question is, uh, maybe we it'd be good to have someone, you know, from the Bugis community, someone's older, come and talk. You think there's someone like that who'd be willing to come onto the show? Yes, uh, I think there is one gentleman called Ibrahim Arif. He's he's a Bugis elder, which I mentioned in the, mm. the conclusion of the book. Yeah, he's I I I I'm sure he'll be quite willing to to speak. Uh, can, Does he speak English? Him. Yes, he speaks English. Okay, he speaks English. Yeah, but but he's very old. He's frail. I think he's about seven, about eighty years old. Already, so. Okay, but okay. He can. He, can, he just messaged me two days ago, asking me a few things. That would be so fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do ask him if, ask if he's willing to do it. We we can do it anytime. Uh, whenever he's, uh, you know, available. Okay. I do. Thanks so much, man, for this yes, re really, you. really Perfect. good uh, speaking to you. You know, someone <laughs> I, I spoke to who is also quite similar to you uh, is uh, Victor Yu, the yes, Chinatown boy, you. right? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> he also, you know, he also started with a camera. Yeah, camera. Yeah. Camera tells everything. Fantastic, camera, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so it's a memory. It's a memory that, that you have immortalized and you last a lifetime. I think the generation today cannot understand it, right? Because we have all the camera in our pocket. Uh, but in those days, the camera was something, it's a piece of technology that allows you some mastery over the changes yes. in Singapore, isn't it? Yes, correct. You have, you have to master uh, with the times, the weather, mm. the location. Then, uh, of course, it's very huge. <laughs> That's right. But it was we enjoyed. Bigger. We enjoyed. I enjoyed. Thanks a lot, bro. Yeah, so, yes, Talk yes. to you soon thank again. Thank you for having me. Yes. And my thank pleasure. Our show. pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Talk to, talk to you again. Okay. All right. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.